Hi everyone, uh, Dave here. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Legends of the Spire. Now, the Chesterfield FC accounts came out recently and we also had the AGM as well. I am a complete novice when it comes to anything like this, but I was quite interested uh, when having a flick through. So I've enlisted the help of Kieran Maguire from the Price of Football podcast to have a look at it for me. Now, The Price of Football is an absolutely excellent podcast each week that talks about football finances from up and down the country. Uh, it's available on all the usual podcast platforms, so please do check it out if you haven't already. I'm sure we've got lots of dedicated listeners to the podcast uh, that also watch this, um, so Kieran will be no stranger to you if so. Uh, he, like I say, has a look at football finances from all over the country, so for him to have an objective look at the Chesterfield accounts, I thought would be quite fun. Uh, I must say before we start it, I am a, uh, a passionate uh, supporter of the Trust and everything they've done since taking over the club, uh, and the investment of the Kirk Brothers looks uh, like an absolutely brilliant move for everyone as well. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens over the next few years. There's obviously, like came out in the AGM, there's a few things that they'd like to um, take a look at and balance out and that's where the help of the Kirk brothers will be really essential uh, and that's where Kieran Maguire comes in so he's had a look at it uh, for us and is going to give us a few comments. Now as always I am at Spire Legends on Twitter and Instagram and Legends of the Spire on Facebook so please do get in touch uh, but here we are with the latest episode let's delve into some accounts as I'm joined by Kieran from the Price of Football podcast to talk about the Chesterfield FC accounts. Here we go. So thanks for joining me to have a have a chat with the, about these accounts. I am completely uh, these things completely go over my head, uh, but I've I've started to educate myself thanks to the price of football. <laughs> 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 so I, I do feel like I'm I'm starting to get a bit of a better handle on these things nowadays. But I suppose football accounts are a bit of a different beast to a lot of other company accounts, are they? Yes, because if I think I think you could look at it from a variety of uh, perspectives. Um, if my local garage goes bust, I'm sad for the garage owner because I've got a relationship with them. But I just move on and get another garage. Um, and also that garage is open 52 weeks of the year, you know, six days a week, if not seven. Um, when it comes to football, you you can't transfer allegiance due to poor performance. Mm. If the business ceases, again, you can't just say, oh, well, I'll pop along and support Forest or Derby or wherever it's going to be. Um, so... Football is unique in the sense that it, it's not very good at generating money. It's not very good at controlling its costs because we measure success not by the profits you make, but by the money you spend because that's seen as investing. Mm -hmm. And you're open, realistically, 25 to 30 days a year. Um, so you put all that together uh, and football is a very strange industry compared to the the profit maximizing ethos that, that exists within uh traditional capitalist models and and that has some benefits and and that also has some pitfalls um as, as you know, if you know anybody that supports Berry or macclesfield town or or you know going back a few years maidstone and so on um, and also the trauma that people are going through at present at uh, yeah, Wigan and Oldham and Rochdale and so on. It's uh, it, it is a strange industry because you, you need competition in football. Whereas Apple would be quite happy if they put Samsung out of business. Well, uh, if you do that in football, you've got nobody to play against. Mm, yeah, totally. And I suppose that's where transparency then in things like accounts is is important to fans, isn't it? Because then they can kind of help to ascertain a bit of a picture of of what their football club is, uh, how healthy it is, which are not a lot of not a lot of fans always get, do they? You're, you're absolutely right. Um, let's face it, you know, we we don't fall in love with football for amortisation policies or sale and leaseback arrangements or any of the nonsense that you t you, you do see. But um, having a, a degree of confidence in the people that run the business through them being transparent honest up to date 
um, does mean that you can sleep a little bit easier at night um, because fans of some clubs can't do that at present uh, because of combination of, of poor management, poor owners, um, and the uh, the stress that goes with potential relegation. You know, not not winning things is is one thing, but uh, we do appear to have become very polarised as fans in in seeing the bad things in football. Uh, yeah, being relegated isn't 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 the worst thing that happens in the world. I'm uh, I, I I teach in the city of Liverpool and I, I go on to Everton shows and I say, actually, you, you'll love life in the Championship. You you see this, you probably see the same number, you know, for the same amount of money, you'll get to see more matches and you'll certainly get to see more victories mm-hmm. and you'll go to visit other places. You know, so, so don't don't worry about it. You know, if, if it if it happens, it happens. But um, it, it is it is a strange strange uh, industry in the sense that um I, I i don't live my life through my local supermarket or my local clothes store or my local uh or my, or my local petrol station but i do live my life through my local football club and its success has an impact upon my, my day-to-day life as a fan and, and, and i'm supposed to be a rational human being uh, mm. but uh yeah we, we we don't behave in, in such a way so therefore having transparency and, and having clubs that are are willing to engage with fans and, and also a little bit of understanding of the numbers because they they are baffling um i'll, I'll mm. be the first to admit to that you know i've, I've got the, the benefit of having done it for well, i started in started in the 70s so um you know uh, does does help to uh, to allay fears or to raise suspicions as and when appropriate. Mm. Yeah, and, and you're right. I quite enjoy life in the National League now. Even, even dropping out of the league isn't that bad. You, you get to see some good new places. Like I say, you win a lot of games. It's quite yeah. fun, really. <laughs> as long as you've got a match to watch. That's the main it, thing, isn't it, a lot of the time? You, you're absolutely right, because football is about shared memories. It's about shared experiences. And whether that's experience or, you know, going to Stamford Bridge or or going to Yeovil. Actually, you can have just as much fun regardless of where the destination is yeah. um, because a football day out, it is a day out th- and it's, you know, as, as my wife always tells me, it's you going with the same blokes, talking the same rubbish in the same pub about the same matches every single week, but it's good for you and it doesn't mm-hmm. actually matter who the opponents are yes it, it, it's nice to to get one over on on a bigger team nobody's denying that but uh, the important thing is that there's a Chesterfield to support and, and it's seeing those faces and being able to share those memories and and to talk that nonsense which, which is actually far more important than the, than the division that you're in yeah absolutely so so if we go to the CFC 2001 limited right so this is quite an interesting time because mm. obviously the backdrop to this Dave Allen big multi-millionaire he was kind of, I don't know, he kind of stumbled into owning us, I think, many years ago, because at that time we couldn't quite afford the move to the new ground. So he came and put a bit of money in, ended up owning us. And then I think it's fair to say, I don't think he'd disagree with me, he probably lost interest <laughs> in losing interest like a lot of football owners do. Then you suddenly hit a spiral. We hit a spiral and and now we've ended up in the National League and are now run by the Community Trust who um, are kind of are in the other part of the ground on the other side. So all these people that have been around the club for many years and some new ones, um, who are kind of club stalwarts in many ways. This is like their first full full year account since they got control of the club. And I remember back at the time, uh, kind of when Dave Allen kind of finally relinquished control and uh, and they handed it all over. There's uh, so much positivity and optimism, and there still is now, Um but obviously, when this set of accounts comes out, it's like that everyone goes straight to have a look, don't they, to see how they're kind of getting on. <laughs> What's their school report for the year? So kind of as a what what are your kind of initial thoughts having a look? Well, the club's losing 45 grand a week. Um, and, and my first thought is, is how is that? Uh, how is that being funded? Um, you you can you can do that to a degree through um, selling players, but you know, at, at the level where Chesterfield are at present, most players are on short contracts. So therefore, um, 
getting decent fees is always a struggle because they're, 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 you know if, if they sign more than a two-year contract that's the ex- very much the exception rather than the norm um or they have to to borrow or the owners have to put money in um and, and in the case of chesterfield the the trust or some somebody has certainly lent uh, quite a bit of money mm. uh, to chesterfield yes yes the clubs also issued shares which is which is good because the good thing about shares is that they they don't have to be repaid um they don't pay interest so the, the club is uh, i think it's in an interesting position uh, it, it's got cash in the bank which is you know one thing you should always uh take a lot of interest in because if you don't have cash you can't pay the bills it's as simple as that and and that that means that uh, predators can come in and exploiters can come in and, and things can deteriorate uh but i think it just shows the the difficult nature of of running a club um clubs clubs in the uh clubs in the national league the vast majority of them own money uh, 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 lose money uh, because you've got some big hitters there who who, who we need not name. Uh, mm. uh, you've got other clubs there who are former members of the EFL, such as Chesterfield, of course, uh, who have had to adapt to uh, a new environment. You know, no TV deal, no solidarity payments from the Premier League, um, and so on. And that has a big impact upon them. Uh, and you've you've got a scenario where. There are now people who are buying clubs in the National League with, with a view to trying to, A, get them into the EFL and, and then to accelerate them, you know, ideally up to the championship. Um, and, and many of those people are wealthy and are prepared to put in large sums. Hmm. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's tough to compete. And, uh, you know, I think, I think Chesterfield, uh, yeah, I think that that's reflected. Yeah, the, the club at a... A wage bill of you know, of over three million pounds. Well, that's that, that's bigger than some clubs yeah. that I'll see in in League Two and uh, at least one club in League One. Mm, yeah, and I think they uh, like the chairman uh, obviously made a few comments at the AGM. We had a, a colossal amount of injuries last season. I think he said at one point we had seven hundred thousand pounds worth of talent in the stands, um, and then we had a manager in which. It seemed like I think I think he I think the chairman said as as well that, that they they maybe chased promotion a little bit um, and and maybe got a bit I suppose it's easy when you you come into uh, kind of running a club and then it starts off well and you're near the top of the table you kind of sometimes you go for it a little bit don't you but then it's it's got tripped up by it a little bit I suppose so it does it, it those staff salaries are quite like I say quite. Uh, big aren't they just over three million yeah. pounds yeah that's up by 50 percent now i appreciate that 2021 was a covid year so therefore you know match day staff and and some other people would have been uh not utilized but you know lo- looking looking at these costs overall um you know to to go from three and a half million to six and a half million in a in a single season mm. uh is is, is a cause for concern um and this isn't a criticism of, of the trust because it's a climatization exercise and when when you're in a, when you're having a party there tends to be very few people thinking about the hangover yeah and that's where i, th- I think you're you're right to point out yeah the, the, the fans want to see the club promoted the trust want to see the club promoted the manager's reputation because you know, football club management is a precarious business i'm uh, I'm, I'm fortunate enough I, I i teach for the lma and and talking to their members um it, it's not a job i'd actually wish on anybody it's it's very precarious it's uh, it's ridiculously stressful and there, there's no such thing as job security in it so under those circumstances uh yeah anybody who says i think we might be overstretching ourselves here is is, is deemed to be the, the person at the party who's who's suggesting party that paper. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah let, let's turn the music down because otherwise we're going to have the police knocking on the door telling it you know telling us to close it down um so the numbers are pretty high um and uh you know just just looking at the, the amount invested in players and so on it's uh 
uh, you know, how, how many how many clubs in in League Two spent four hundred and eighty two thousand pounds on players last season? I think we'll find very very few. But but Chesterfield did in uh, in the National League, so uh, you know it's it's probably the uh, it's certainly the highest that I've got here. You know, I've, I've got the figures going back many many years. Um, and Chesterfield historically had been quite successful at selling players and getting add-on fees yeah. and so on, but uh, it's it, it's a huge investment historically. And uh, if that investment works, then 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 nobody cares. Um, but uh, you know, for every uh, every, every bargain you pick up, there's a danger of picking up a uh, you know a, a Jack Rodwell um, yeah. as, as Sunderland found it, when when they were. Uh, in uh, in in the league, and uh, that works out as as very expensive when you're you're playing somebody Champions League. Sorry, when you're playing somebody Premier League wages in League One, because you never thought you're going to get relegated, and you end up with no relegation clauses in contract. So it, it can, it, it's uh, it, they're, they're an interesting set of numbers from an outsider's perspective, because I look at that and I say, well, where is the funding coming from? Uh, you know, you, I appreciate you made your comments with regards to Dave Allen and, and the trust is is pretty generous and, and money is coming in from shareholders. Can that continue um, in in the long term? You know, I'm I'm not in a position to to comment on that because you, you're you're close to the club as as are other people. Um, I'm just uh, I, I'm, I'm just a teacher with a big calculator. Mm. It's interesting as well because obviously James Rowe was the manager for a lot of this period and now he is. Uh, he was gone and a lot of things happened with him, which we will not need to mention. Um, but uh, now we've brought Paul Cook back. And like you say, um, a lot of historically when we've made money as a, as a club, um, it was kind of the last time <laughs> he was he was here with us. And I think we've probably noticed since there's a lot of players we have in the squad now that seem like a much more saleable assets than players we've had over the last few years. And I think he's even spoken himself about you know, um, needing some contracts to come to an end because these sometimes when when you do uh, go big at the party, um, the hangover can be quite long, can't it? If you're then waiting for a contract with eighteen months left on it to expire, it can it can drag on for a few years, can't it? It can, and then then you're between the devil and the deep blue sea because um, it doesn't matter where you work. It does all come down to relationships and networks, um, and it doesn't matter who you know what the job is. If if the relationship deteriorates, whatever reason, um, the quality of your work tends to be impacted. And and you might not do it consciously, but subconsciously, it's the uh, I'm I'm not going to put that extra effort in tr through in training. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, it's not a case of not trying, but it's it. It's it's a case of perhaps not busting a gut because why should I? The the, you know, the, the manager says something about me or the chairman says something about me, and, uh, and I think it's unfair. And uh, I'll I'll never be critical of, of football players who who do respond in such a way because actually what we're talking about is human nature. We we actually respond far better to praise than criticism, mm -hmm. um, and and the best form of criticism is motivational. You know, it is uh, it is helping people to identify their weaknesses and, and uh, you know, help them to develop rather than just saying you're rubbish. Mm. Um, you know, where, where does that get you anywhere? And, and I think this is, this is one thing we don't acknowledge at fans because all that we say is you're rubbish. You know, I've paid my money. I'm entitled to an opinion, um, but I'm, I'm a great believer in, in nurturing talent. So uh, if, if you take a look at the money that, that Chesterfield were making, you know, 2016, they, they made two million pounds from player sales, a million pounds in the next two years, and and now that's that's not the case, um, and it is uh, it, it is a cause for concern um, in terms of the the player sale model was worth you know fifteen to twenty percent of the club's total income uh, because football clubs make money from ticket sales, they make it from uh, broadcast deals, which, as we know in the in the national league, are less generous, um, and they make it from on the commercial side of things as well, um, which tends to be in alignment with the local and national economy. Both of which, you know, we we know is, is 
you know, the economy, regardless, and this is not a party political comment, that the economy is not firing on all cylinders at present. Mm -hmm. And therefore, people who are thinking about sponsorship, they're also conscious that their staff, staff are moaning that they've not had a pay rise or they've had a poor pay rise. And you go, well, if I go and sponsor Chesterfield Football Club at the same time as uh, giving myself a 2% pay rise, that's actually going to make things worse. You know, people are going to go and say, well, you, your, your priority is wrong. So it, it's, a, it, it's a really tough position to be in. Um, and therefore, if you can uh, spot the talent, nurture that talent, get other people to spot that talent once they're at Chesterfield, um, you, you can start to have that fourth income stream, which which can make the difference between breaking even and, and making significant losses. Mm. Yeah. And obviously, another big part of a lot of clubs income now is your kind of hospitality banqueting side of things. And obviously, this set of accounts comes after covid and a lot of clubs are uh are coming out of that aren't they so you'll you'll see it in a lot of accounts i suppose won't you in how how they're recovering from that period and i work in the arts industry so i know how how slow it has been for people's mm. confidence to come back and all those bookings and and things to come back um so i suppose it's it's interesting like you've you've got in the um in the turnover it has gone up from yeah yeah just nearly touching two million to touching 4 million hasn't it so it's um it's kind of growing back but that's that's quite instrumental as well isn't it that kind of recovery from post covid time it, it it is i mean if if we look at the the three main areas of income for clubs which is ticket sales ticket sales were you know, cl close to zero in mm. 2021 because of because of lockdown so so we'd expect a bounce back there and and that was the vast majority of the recovery uh, commercial income did more than double because you you now had the ability to um, host events at the ground, and, and I think that's something which you've you've got to have a really good commercial team. Uh, but as you, as you rightly said, trying to persuade people to part with cash or also to part with the level of cash that you're expecting is is increasingly challenging, um, and you know the, the the money that comes from TV in uh in in the national league is about seven or eight percent of your total uh whereas it, it can be around about a quarter in uh, in the efl because the efl has their own tv deal but they also get what's referred to as solidarity payments from the premier league which are actually worth more than the efl's own tv deal itself uh so so you know that that's that's a big loss for clubs and and once you get into uh, the EFL, it then becomes a struggle to to stay there. You, if you talk to fans of you know the likes of Barrow and Harrogate and Sutton, uh, you know it's it's a tremendous achievement uh, to get promoted because the National League is, is well, as you know yourself is is really tough, uh, but it's it doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're going to springboard your way out of League Two and into League One and so on mm. uh, because. Uh, everybody's fighting for every point yeah um, and what about the um the expenditure uh the administrative expenditures bit because i've i've heard when you talked about chesterfield before you said that the that the detail is quite nice on a on a chesterfield yeah, set of accounts it. i love um, chesterfield it's it's good to have uh like I say talking about transparency earlier to have things split down into lighting and heating and bank charges and printing and stationery and that that kind of stuff is it's interesting. Is any of those numbers that kind of jump out at you? Probably hotels. <laughs> a lot, a lot. Apparently, the previous manager liked four star hotels. <laughs> well, I think we all like four star hotels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I mean, you know, spending four hundred grand on hotels, spending over, spending just shy of a quarter of a million pounds on legal costs. Um, you know, that's, you know, these six figure sums are, you're spending more on legal costs than you are on heating and lighting. Mm. Um, now, I appreciate that that was before the, the big jumps that we've seen. Um, the, the wage bill up by 50%. Yeah, th these are, these are significant. So you, you get, um, you know, ground up keep and premises up a hundred grand. Well, you shouldn't be spending necessarily more on upkeep. Uh, just because it's a non-COVID year, because yeah, the groundsman has to put fertilizer on the pitch, regardless of the year. 
So th there's not many of these expenses going down. I'll say no more than that. Um, and when we look at that issue of player costs and the fact that Chesterfield spent, uh, you know, what, I think that figure I gave was what, £482,000 mm. on yeah. uh, player registrations. Looking at these figures, it appears to be on players for a one-year contract. And, and that that got me saying, well, that, that's, a, that's a lot of money. Uh, because it's all been amortised, it's all been written off. And normally, what you do, if you if you sign a player for half a million pounds and they're on a two year contract, you say, well, yeah, we, we take the cost and we divide that by the number of years. And five hundred thousand divided by two gives us a cost of two hundred and fifty grand a year. So therefore, you can say, well, they're on two year contracts. But looking at this, it's uh, you know, Chesterfield has spent a lot of money on players in twenty one, twenty two, and those players appear to be on one year deals. Mm. Um, and is that money well spent? Yeah, you know, again, I don't know. I, I know nothing about football, uh, yeah. as, as I, I, I'll, I'll openly admit. Um, <laughs> and, and certainly, having, having talked for the LMA and then sat sort of, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just set at the canteen listening to the guys talking. And, and the more I realise just how little I know about football, uh, yeah, you know, I go, I go with a fan's eye, and, and they see it from a completely different perspective. Uh, but from a finance point of view, you go, well, that does seem. Um, very strange because the the value the 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 accounting value of the squad at the end of the season was zero, mm. uh, despite having spent all that money. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's odd. Yeah, they spent they they spent big by national league standards. As you as you said, they gambled. They're trying to get promoted, and that's fine if you achieve the objective. But it's. Uh, it's not fine if, if if you don't. You then say, well, you know, we've not only we've we got the high wages, we've we've effectively written off those transfer fees. We're not going to be able to sell those players for fees um, unless they they sign new contracts and so on. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think probably well, two hundred and fifty thousand of that probably is Kabongo Shamanga, who came in, scored lots of goals, and then broke his ankle and is now going to. Um, uh, is on loan at Peterborough at the moment, and then at the end of the season, they have an obligation to buy of a quarter of a million pounds. I think they okay. get some of that back, but apparently that was something to do with Peterborough's modelling that they couldn't put the money in this year, so it goes into next year or something, hence why it was a loan. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> yeah, something, yeah. Something uh, uh, there's, there's strange things happening at Peterborough. I'll say no more than that. Um, right. They, uh, their finances are a bit head-scratching at times. Let's hope they pay our two hundred and fifty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean the 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 one thing, you know, the EFL come in for a lot of criticism, and I think a lot of that criticism was probably fully justified four or five years ago. Um, but since Trevor Birch has come in as as chief exec, uh, they they have very much tightened up the rules, and those those teams which are late in making transfer payments uh, instantly tend to get a transfer embargo. Uh, so, so you, you can normally spot and looking at the transfer embargo page of of the EFL website, which uh, be, because I'm a sad old man with no life, is something that I do on a regular basis. Peterborough aren't there yet, so um, you know that that's good news for uh, Chesterfield. <laughs> and uh, so, a big thing that happened this year was that the the Kirk brothers came in, and the Kirk brothers are uh, kind of Chesterfield fans. Uh, made a lot of money in their separate businesses and then have now basically got 25%, I think, of shares, which was voted for, and they put in a million pounds into the club. So there's now one of them is going to be kind of sitting on the board and kind of giving them more of his expertise and experience in getting a lot of these things under control, which seems like a positive move. And a bit of outside investment is is good as well. I'm just interested in terms of that model of kind of charitable trusts or um kind of groups like that owning clubs is it inevitable that then that money just has to come in just because of those like you say those costs of football that that just invariably happen yeah i i think if you've got a football club which is living beyond its means which is the vast majority of them um you you have to look to see what are the alternatives with respect to generating the funds to plug those gaps you can borrow money 
but I can guarantee you that a bank will not lend you that money. Banks don't want the reputational damage. They don't want the risk associated with football. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you end up borrowing money from owners. If the owners are the fans, it becomes more difficult because as individual fans, we all have our existing financial commitments. We've got families. We've got, you know, we've got to heat and eat first and foremost. And therefore, it is a tricky exercise. You can borrow from wealthy owners, but the nature of having a, a trust own the football club is that it tends to be a more democratised approach. Mm. So therefore, uh, with regards to the Kirk brothers, Chesterfield are in, I think they're in quite a good position, again, as an outsider making an observation, but it could lead to a position in a year or two as to what does the trust do next if we take a look at Portsmouth for example Portsmouth were in a terrible position for many years they are the only club to have gone into administration whilst being in the Premier League and once they were jettisoned from the Premier League once they were relegated they then went on sort of a glorified musical chairs of owners trying to transfer toxic deck debt to another mug. And there was a series of financial disasters eventually resulting in the supporters trust acquiring the club. And they then had stability. But the downside about stability, it's a bit boring and it does give a ceiling and eventually Portsmouth sold or the Portsmouth Community Trust or the equivalent of sold the club to Michael Eisner, who was the former chief executive of Disney. Now, he has put money into the club. There's no doubt about it. Fans, of course, would like him to put in more because fans don't actually want investors. Fans want sugar daddies. A sugar daddy is somebody who will indulge the fans, as, the, as a sugar daddy would do for um, the normal people that they're connected with by buying them expensive baubles and toys and trinkets in the form of expensive football players. So where we are with Chesterfield is that it's great to have a minority investor um, put in money and also be able to bring their expertise and knowledge to the club. The downside is potentially where do we go next if chesterfield trust supporters trust wants to be perfectly happy bobbling along in the national league you know ideally get into the playoffs get promoted in due course that's fine but are going to do it on a restricted budget that's one thing if you want to accelerate that and we've seen what's happened at both wrexham and Notts county uh, you have people coming in um, you and I know both know what Paul Mullins' salary is at Wrexham. He's a magnificent footballer. Uh, he's he's a League One player on a League One wages, playing two divisions below, but but scoring the goals that you'd ex expect from a player of his talent. Um, that's very expensive, and uh, that's where having owners come in who are wealthy can make a difference. If you listen to Wrexham fans, they're, they're not necessarily happy, though, are they? I, I, I'm, I presume that you watched uh, Welcome to Wrexham and the amount of moaning that I saw from, from fans who were very vitriolic every time they failed to win um, was uh, was quite surprising. It did, in fact, you know, take me back. They they were starting to come across a bit like the, the entitled fans that you see in the Premier League who have got a financial advantage and therefore feel that matches should be won regardless of whether the team turn up on a Saturday or not, um, and failing to recognise that for many other clubs in the National League, there is an element of resentment. And because Wrexham are getting all of the attention effectively in the league is directed towards not the club itself, it's, it's, it's really directed towards the owners. And that does mean that uh, both fans and players and managers of the opposing team are going to put in that much more effort to try to thwart them. Yeah, and, and like you say, fans want ambition, don't they? And mm -hmm. they want success. But when they get success, they want more ambition and they want more success. And it just kind of, it just uh, gathers and gathers and gathers at pace, doesn't it? And like you say, then you can end up with uh, 
fans saying you're not being ambitious enough. <laughs> Even maybe they're being over ambitious for the size of their club. So is is part of the responsibility down to the fans to kind of uh, try and temper their ambitions sometimes. Spending somebody else's money is very very easy, and that's what fans want to be able to do. If you talk to Chelsea fans they will not have a bad word to say about Roman Abramovich. It's exactly the same with Manchester City fans and Sheikh Mansour. Why is that? Well, under Roman Abramovich, Chelsea lost £900,000 a week for 19 years. From a business point of view, that's absolutely appalling. But he was willing to underwrite those losses. And by underwriting those losses, Chelsea won the Premier League four times they won the Champions League on these two occasions they did very well in the domestic cups as well and uh, you can therefore see why they were so popular exactly the same with Manchester City and, and their owners fans see that at other levels and say well we've got a new owner why can't they be a mini Abramovich a mini Mansour um, and, and, and we'll love the owners as much as Chelsea fans love Abramovich mm. Yeah. So going back to Chesterfield, if you were the chairman, <laughs> what what would you do? <laughs> Spend less money on player wages? <laughs> well, it, it depends where the funding is going to come from. I would sit down um, with the trust. I would sit down also with uh, the broader fan base, certainly have a, you know, a town hall meeting or however you want to describe these things. Um, I would sit down with the Kirk brothers and say, we need... We need a plan. We need a strategy. Uh, this is what we are proposing to do over the course of the next five years. This is where we know where the money is guaranteed to come in from. This would allow us to spend so much on wages, so much on player transfers. If anybody wants to put any more in, we can change those numbers and then look around the room to see who's putting their hands up. Mm. I think they've come out and said that a realistic cost it somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 million on the kind of a player a player budget uh apparently kind of going forward so it's obviously something that they're going to be going to be looking at looking at doing but you can't uh, change something dramatically overnight can you because then the fans can get a bit restless can't they <laughs> i suppose if, if then uh Yes, fan, fans can get restless and i think this is where engagement is really important uh, I know Andy Holt of Accrington Stanley quite mm. well. And uh, if you follow Andy on social media, or if mm. you've ever heard Andy being interviewed, he is blunt. He will talk to anybody about what he's prepared to do, the level of support he's prepared to give the club, and he's not prepared to give a penny more. And he said to the fans, if you don't think I'm up to the job, take over. You know, good luck. Try it yourself. And... It's again, I think it's very easy to be critical of somebody else when you've not actually walked in their shoes mm. and you've not had the challenge of how are we going to meet the payroll this month? How are we going to pay HMRC? We've not paid the company that drives the, the, the players to, to away matches for the last two months. They're now threatening to, to down tools and, and then come back and tell me how easy it is to run a football club. So I think there's a lot of naivety because we are a generation that perhaps have been indulged at times. Uh, that is enjoyable. We've we've all played football manager. Uh, but running an actual football club is slightly more complex because I can't just say start new game mm. in the real world because we do have legacy issues when it comes to football players because they will sign uh, in, in, in the... National League, as you probably are, I think most contracts go up to the 30th of April uh, and they're only actually 10 month contracts unless you sign more than a one year deal uh, in order to try to uh, deal with the, the challenges of what is a very costly operation. Mm. But trying to get a, a new squad effectively each year, unless you've got players on long term commitments, is really difficult. And there are other people there with deeper pockets and flashier wallets and you've therefore got to make a decision as to am I going to stick or twist uh, in terms of the amount of money we're, we're, which we are prepared to spend and, and seeing everything that you've seen over the years if you if you if you won euro millions would you be tempted to buy a football club 
<laughs> you know, because it's like you say, it's a heavy responsibility being the custodian of a cultural asset for a for a, an, an area. Um, obviously, it can be you get the success, and it can be it can be great fun. But it's I imagine it's a twenty four hour a day job, isn't it? it it's certainly a it's a twenty four hour a day commitment, and there are many sleepless nights. I'm a Brighton fan. Now I, I can remember playing at Chesterfield back in in the old League Two days. Yeah, we had some great scraps with Chesterfield. I'm sure you remember. Uh, we are now in the Premier League. We, we are now trying to get into Europe, the semi-final of the FA Cup. But that's cost our owner over four hundred million pounds. So, if I won the Euro Millions, I wouldn't be able to afford it. I, 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 it, it and uh, yeah, and if, if you read the newspapers, oh, the, the constant message that come across, Brighton's a really well-run club. Well, we've been known that's had to put in 400 million quid of his own money. So that's that's the insanity of how how we judge success. Mm. The, the most the most profitable football club in in the history of the in the Premier League years is Spurs. You talk to Spurs fans, they they just moan. They're completely miserable because they don't. We we don't follow a football club for its financial results. We we fall in love because we want to see it win trophies. We want to see it qualify for tournaments. We want to see it get promoted and so on. But the the financial element is uh, at the other end of the spectrum because when Chelsea played Manchester City in the Champions League in 2021. And we are talking about clubs who have won the Premier League between them, is it 10 times in the last 15 years or the last 17 years? Uh, you know, an, an incredible achievement. Uh, those, those two clubs are the biggest loss-making clubs in the history of English football. And I'm not talking by a small margin, I'm talking by hundreds of millions. So that's... That's what football is. It's the most illogical, insane, but at the same time lovable industry uh, in the country. That sums it sums it up very well. <laughs> so I suppose you'll just be to to finally just to sum up, you'll be keeping an eye then. I suppose on on our accounts like you do on on everyone's. I suppose you I suppose you uh, uh, you kind of keep an eye out on what the trends are happening around the country, don't you? Yes, uh, as I said earlier, I'm a uh, I'm an old man with no friends and no life. Uh, so for my sins, I, I monitor every club, Premier League, EFL, National League, Scottish leagues, just to try to get a feel for this um, and stick numbers up on spreadsheets and so on, with with a view to sort of identifying what's happening in in the game and and to try to make sense of it for myself as much as anything else um, mm. and if other people find it vaguely interesting that's that's a bonus but everybody's losing money uh, we've had the results of 12 premier league clubs so far uh, for 21 22 remember 21 22 was a post covid season mm. and we're talking about the premier league which is the most successful league uh, in world football. Well, of those twelve teams, eleven lost money. Tell, tell that's the trend uh, of the twenty-four championship clubs. Twenty-four lost money. That's that's football. <laughs>